So let me give a little bit of background of, uh, of Benedict. So uh, he was trained in physics, like many of our speakers, at the University of Manchester. And then he moved on with a PhD in Nijmegen under uh, David uh, Norris, uh, already working on new techniques for bold functional imaging. Um, after that, he had a couple of postdoctoral fellowships. Uh, I mentioned uh, Essen in Germany, but also the one in Hawaii that looks very exotic and exciting as well. Uh, and then he came to, um, uh, to Maastricht, where he moved up the academic ladder and, and currently is a, is a full professor. So um, Ben's research is really interdisciplinary at the interface of MR physics, covering um, sequence development, image reconstruction, PTX, and ultra high field, um, and covering that, making the bridge with uh, cognitive neuroscience. So we're extremely happy to have you here as well, Ben. Please, the stage is yours. This was happening to me like this, but it, ah, this sounds much better. That's why I asked you first if you could hear me, but okay. Um, I will not redo the words of gratitude. You heard them all, um, and how great it is to be drinking with you people, hopefully later. But um, yeah, of course not. That's a 45 second delay. They will get it. There is a delay on YouTube. It will come. It will come. Anyway, I think. Incremental solutions, that's what I was talking about. That's what we need. <laughs> it's baby steps. <laughs> baby steps of getting things to work. <laughs> anyway, so back to the title here. So this is, you know, Dimitri also introduced. It's what I do. Yeah, no, I thought so. Thanks. Thanks, whoever pointed that out then. Um, yeah, so sequence hacks is usually what keeps us, um, you know, going in the neuroscience. A small, small incremental changes to the technology that is fairly established that sort of um, it takes us along to push the boundary slowly, but not in, in this disruptive sort of way. Um, I'll go fast now because I just showed it before. Of course, the um, better than linear increase in SNR that we get as we go up in field strength is, is rewarded. I made the money example just now. So if you, you consider your Tesla or field strength costing you a million, that means that you're getting a pretty good return on investment if you go for a high field scanner. That's nice. High field is the way to go. That's what I say. That's what I do. That's what I love. And this little exponent here is pretty damn good news in every respect. Okay, but it's not only SNR that goes up. I mean, we have the changes in susceptibility and phase contrast. We have the changes in the relaxation times, for the better or the worse. Um, that generates new contrasts that suddenly become interesting at high field and give us additional information, whether you use them just as a contrast or wrap them to something that ultimately, ultimately leads to quantitative imaging. It's kind of left up to you. We have the changes in the chemical shift, which gives us uh, spectral resolution, which is great for stuff just like spectroscopy or the CEST applications and whatnot which will, I think, be important in a clinical 
setting once these methods get developed further uh, than they are now, maybe. Okay, so in this talk, um, as Dimitri alluded to, I will mainly talk about fMRI acquisition. I will not talk about anatomy. Um, I will talk a lot about sort of echoplanar stuff and going beyond it, um, doing sort of non-Cartesian spiral kind of uh, uh, readouts. Um, I will also talk a little about parallel transmission as a sort of somewhat orthogonal topic, but this is another thing that has been close to my heart uh, in the past years, and which I think is a technology that really, really would benefit from being developed further and to be brought to actual use more so than it is actually usable now. Okay. So if you ask a neuroscience person what they want to do, they would probably give you something like those numbers here in terms of the resolution they would at minimum want. Right? The 7 Tesla, I think, if you want to do something exciting, you want to be starting looking at the layers, you need 0.8 millimeter resolution. If you go to higher field strengths, you want a bit more. But if you look at the volume ratio of those voxels and the SNI increase using Clausus and, um, and uh, the, the Pohlmann equation, you see there's a quite a disconnect between those two. Right? And then you go up in field strength, maybe 10.5. 0.6 is the minimum you want. In the Aroma project at 11.7, we're going for 0.5 whole brain. And those ratios, they get a little crazy in terms of what you want and what the pure SNI increase does, right? So, I mean, by all means, you have to conclude that we're pretty damn greedy on our mission of resolving the brain higher. So we need a lot more other things to come into play. It's not just the SNI. That alone will not cut it. Okay, so we are stuck here in this upheld battle, battle for sensitivity. I mean, this goes back to the old classic paper by Christina, um, which basically showed that very, very quickly, when you, when you go up in, in resolution, you end up on that slope where you're just purely limited by SNR. There's no physiological, there's nothing else sort of really being troublesome. You're just starved for SNR, and this is what you need to fix. Okay, there are some fixes to this, or some relief at least, if you're, you're in love with Bolt, and I will tell you, you don't have to be. There are alternatives to it. Um, the... Signal changes of related activation, they go pretty up, pretty, pretty, uh, go up pretty fast with T2 star changes. Also, if you do T2, which gets tricky at high field, of course, you will see that you have not only the sort of um, increase in field strength, uh, increase in signal change, but also the stronger weighting towards the microvasculature. So there are some nice opportunities to get into, um, and that gives you some relief. And then, of course, plainly translating the higher SNR into smaller voxel sizes is great, because then you can sort of exclude the stuff you don't want messing up your signal, sort of uh, the, the peel veins, for instance, which is a real problem in bold. But the question, of course, remains, is small, small enough? Of course it's not, right? I mean, the cortex is two to four millimeters. And how many voxels can we squeeze in there? Like three, four? And they're angled funny and stuff is sort of just messed up and moves a little bit? No, it's not small enough. And, of course, there's a whole big world beyond bold. There's all these other contrasts, there's the other readouts. Klaus was mentioning some of them. So here on the left, it's just, I'm not going to go into detail here, just sort of ways of acquiring the stuff and sampling the stuff. And here on the right, sort of some contrasts that I sort of have been floating around, and I'm sure more will be added to this. Because there is. But anyway, so whatever your choice of method you go for, you will basically be trapped somewhere in the triangle where you're trading off between temporal resolution, spatial resolution, coverage, and basically those fundamental things that, that hinder uh, MR from being really fast and the sort of easy-to-use method that we would really love it to be. You are trapped in there. But at some point, someone goes, da-da, this magic fairy comes along and wiggles a stick, and you can grow that triangle a little bit by whatever pushing technology you can throw at it. And that's great, because then you have more flexibility. You can go any direction in that triangle a bit more freely, you know, and invest it the way you want. So every little bit of SNR counts, and of course the factors playing into this is the main magnetic field as we talked about. There's the gradient performance of the transmit, right? There's the receive, there's pulse sequence, super important. That's, that's what I say because I love doing it. There is image reconstruction, super important because I love doing it. There is also, uh, on the processing side, smart ways of doing your fMRI. Smart ways of doing fMRI when you're slow in sampling, smart ways of fMRI when you're fast in sampling. So all these things, they will have to come together. Um, the stuff I'm going to talk about and what I do, um, so basically mainly pulse sequences, some image reconstruction, and I'm going to talk a bit about ZAR management at the end, and it's basically going to be just a gallery walk of pretty pictures. I'm not going to go into any big depth here. Now, coming to sequences for functional imaging. EPI, of course, has been the workout, the workhorse for this all along. I mean, Mansfield came up with that early on. He tried to do some cardiac with it, I believe, even in the late 70s. And it's basically been there all along. It's easy, 
not on the gradients, but it's easy in the reconstruction. You just do your Fourier transform, and a bit of parallel imaging is easy to throw this as well. Some phase correction needed, but fine. On the whole, it's fast and easy in just real time. And it's become super established for bold ASL, for the vaso, all the diffusion provided imaging. Some people use it in the body. I'm not going to talk about body. I'm only going to talk about head. But EPI is just a rock solid sequence that has matured over many years now. And we're kind of stuck with it. And I don't know whether we have to be, but that's how it is. Single shot 2D is most common, as we know. Um, but if you go up in field strength into higher resolutions, you would also like to sort of um, go beyond it a bit. It turns out that 3 dpi is like super attractive there, but if you go up in resolution, um, there are other issues that speak for SNR, slice profile, spin history, and the sampling you can do along the, the KZ direction that suddenly emerges. And it turns out that depending on what the resolution is that you're interested in, you might be better off or will be better off uh, using 3D. So this thing really doesn't work, is it? It's very dim. Anyway. Um, so there is a cutoff or the, the, the crossing point at about one and a half millimeter voxels. And going beyond that in resolution or going to smaller voxels, 3D sampling actually turns out to be better. And I mean, that's what we found quite early on. That's also confirmed by at least two pieces of work coming here out of Lausanne, Nerov's group, um, Witzke's work, essentially. So bear that in mind. But still, it's just a tweak on the 2D, right? I mean, what, what, what's the real difference? You just do your phase encoding a bit differently. Anyway, so about 10 years ago then, some really cool stuff happened. People realized they could do multiband DPI, they figured out how to do the reconstruction for it, and that for the neuroscience was a serious game changer, right? You could have multiplicative accelerations in the brain sampling by factors two, three, four, eight, they use in the human connectome project, that's serious. We can do that in the three DPI as well, using hyperinia, it's, it's basically exactly the same thing. If you look at it from, as, from a, as a Phillips person, if you look at it from a sense perspective, you go like, yeah, duh, that's obvious. But I think um, in the Phillips, in the Siemens world, that wasn't embraced so quickly. I would love to share some interesting review comments here we had on that paper. They were kind of disturbing. But anyway, it's, it's fundamentally the same thing. With multiband 2D, you're sampling the same thing as you do in any 3D sequence. You construct it the same way, too, if you like. Anyway, that's not how they chose to do it for the 2D. I mean, for the 2D, they reconstruct slightly differently. Um, I'm putting Cowan's face up here. It's the only face I'm going to put up in this talk because I think his contribution has been absolutely significant even though also incremental, if some might argue on the basis of history, and I just put a lot of citations here because I don't want to get into a tangle here, but if you want to check it out, there's two good review papers, one of which I actually wrote with Cowan a while ago. So check those out if you really want to know the history and you know, how things come together. It's kind of interesting. Yeah, so just one example of what flexibility that gives you doing hyperinia. So this is the 3D example that we showed quite early on, is you can really take all the coil acceleration capability and just trade it off freely into any direction you want. So you can go up to pretty absurdly high acceleration factors if you want. I mean, in practice, you wouldn't, but you can if you do and sample your brain like super fast or you accelerate some other direction and you do a bit slower, but you get high resolution out of it or any trade-off in between. So it's, it's kind of cool having that flexibility, and this is exactly what made the multiband so successful as well. Okay, so if you want to go higher in resolution, at some point you run into trouble with the readout of the EPI being too long and you just get distortion or you can't reach deco time um, and then you need to start segmenting. So this is what is becoming a bit more research focus or development focus of some people because we have realized we need to do this. Unless you buy like absurdly powerful gradients, you need to start segmenting and this is some example here from the, uh, from the MGH. Every Berman and, and John Polimeni did this with some special pulse designs from Will Grissom in fact. And then you start doing segmented, and then in this way, sorry, this thing makes funny noises. I'm just going to take it out. Um, so you can do, you know, 0.6 millimeter isotropic, you know, at pretty reasonable levels of distortion um, without things looking too bad. But it's slow. That's the problem. Anyway, I just wanted to show for completeness. Pushing on a little further, you can go away like, yeah, EPI, let's tweak it a little bit. Let's just dare to be just a tiny bit non-Cartesian here, which is hard because the readouts are so, so short, right? But there was this wave work doing, being done in the flash, of course, also coming out from, from Birkin and, and Cowan, where you can wiggle your gradient like a lot. You just go like la, 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 la. You wiggle it along doing a long flash readout, but the one you try doing this on EPI, you really run into the trouble of actually having to do some meaningful wiggle here in a millisecond or less. So that's tough. Anyway, we tried. Um, so this actually goes back to Hawaii. This was some stuff we did in Hawaii for like a nice winter break. When we met up there, the three of us with Andy Stanger and you know, sat around the scanner. Coded and played. We also sat at the beach, most of good. But anyway, that's what we did. It was very preliminary work, really. 
but it basically showed that you can bring the G factors down in a highly accelerated um, scan here. So this was actually done in the 9.4, 7 test, I can't remember. So I did that when I was back in Maastricht. But you could really see that how the maximum G factor really drops quite a lot by playing the wave uh, on an otherwise you know, similarly sampled image. And that was actually pretty promising. Um, so here's the parameters. You can only afford two cycles, and those are the gradient levels. Uh, but it doesn't really matter. Um, but finally enough, I mean, since it was done in Hawaii, this ended up in a birthday card I got from a group. This is actually a field camera measurement of the wave chi EPI here. And you see the waves kind of going here. And I'm sort of supposedly surfing them. And here's the little wiggles that we played out on the phase encoding axis there. So anyway, that much. Um, I haven't actually continued it much yet, but Birkin is still working on it, and there's some pretty cool stuff coming out of the, the group there at the moment where they figured, okay, maybe you can do a half cycle on one readout and like a one cycle on the other. This is what you can just about manage with the available slew rates and the small durations you have during the EPI readout. It's, the constraints are ridiculous, I can tell you, but it's doable. Getting back to more simple things, and if you're on a, on a Siemens scanner where things are kind of black boxy, but we always have the ambitions that whatever we develop goes to the product reconstruction to make it accessible for the users, but you don't really know what's happening. Necessarily in the reconstruction side, we try to control it from the, from the sequence side. It really matters how you get your calibration data. And this, this totally sucks and it's scientifically uninteresting, but it really so matters that you take the time to figure out what the hell is going on at the scanner when these data are acquired, when your person is breathing, moving, whatever. Everything matters. How you get your reference data, how the moving falls into the calibration data, acquisition there, which you can reorder slightly, especially if you're 3D, you're a bit more flexible. And the kernel size of the grappa matters. It matters how you, how you do the regularization, and you have no idea what they're really doing. There is a nice blog post by Renzo Huber on his website, actually, that tries to get to the bottom of this. And if you're on a, on a Siemens machine I really, and, and do that kind of EPI reconstruction, I really encourage you to check it out as well. So everything kind of matters, um, and that's just how it is. It's, it's worth just getting things to work nicely if you do EPI. Even if you don't understand what you're doing, it, it's worth the effort to then set up something that works and you don't touch it. Uh, sorry, it sounds really dumb, but it's, that, that, that's how it is. In terms of um, the same story for 2D, I mean, here there's something that, that fleet did, sort of a way of segmenting the reference data slightly differently. Again, this is something from MGH, and John, and John came up with that, I think. Um, and I'm not sure how well it shows here on that slide. There's some fairly high resolution EPI with it on the 9.4, mixed with some PDX thrown at it as well. You see how this thing is like super grainy, but this comes out super nice. So it's actually the same data reconstructed with a slightly differently acquired reference data. So those things matter. That's all I'm saying. Simple stuff matters a heck of a lot for the end user neuroscience. Yeah, no rocket science there, but it matters. Same thing for 3D. I'm not going to go into any details here, but I'm just going to show you that the very same data reconstructed in two different ways, it's a factor of 100%, depending which way you look, in SNR. And that does matter for you have my statistics, I can tell you. Okay. Um, so what can we do with that wonderful thing, EPI? I'm just going to show you some examples of where we have been pushing things. We, not always being me, obviously, it's the other people that do all the hard work. One of them being Renzo, um, who has been pushing the 3D EPI with uh, like a vaso preparation very hard, vaso being an fMRI method that measures changes in blood volume instead of bold. And the nice thing is that the blood volume changes, they're pretty well localized to the capillaries. So you're actually measuring something which is closer to the site of neuron activation than, than what you would do with a bold signal, which by its nature is more you know, up on the surface of the cortex because it's very much dominated by the peel veins and so on. So that's actually pretty nice. Um, that's what the sequence looks like. I mean, just to just give you an idea, it has an inversion pulse here with a bit of a phase skip. It's to your foci, so it's efficient at high field. And then you have two readouts at different times. One is the, the vaso readout, which falls exactly at the point where, after inversion, the blood goes through zero, so the fMRI signal you acquire does not have a bolt, bolt, sorry, does not have blood contribution in it. So what means that you actually measure a negative signal change during the activation. And the signal continues sort of recovering. And they have another readout, which is bolt weighted. And then you can actually use that for simultaneous bolt acquisition, but also do a bolt correction on that other more interesting signal that you really care about. Anyway, so this is how it works. So you can actually do that with a multiband, as I just showed here. But you can also have a 3D EPL readout with Kaipi or not, as you wish. And that allows you to actually get to effectively somewhat higher spatial specificity than you can easily do with bold, at least. And this is just one example here of, of Renzo's work where they um, actually used um, different 
different fMRI tasks with finger tapping and not touching and, and, and so on to measure or dis to distinguish the activation profiles ac across the cortex depending on whether there was input or out output to the cortex. And that was actually very nice to see. Now, can we, cross, can, can we extend that across brain regions and hemispheres? Well, yes, he meanwhile well, could. He's basically been able to actually push this further to whole brain basal at the moment, which is, which is really nice. Um, yeah, just another example here um, before moving on. So this is a um, columnar digit representations here, where it actually turns out the specificity is so high that it can actually resolve the, the columnar representation of the finger digits and how that is really represented along the cortex here, which is cool. Nicely resolved with the vaso here, where the ball gets a bit blobby, it's like, yeah, what the heck's going on here? It's not so nice, but with the vaso, you can actually see it better, just as an illustration of the specificity you can get. We are running that also on the um, 9.4, at least for that one study we did, um, where B1 is a bit more of a mess. You see that sort of central brightening is very pronounced here. Um, and the readout is sort of up here, so there was an experiment with low spatial coverage. And the sequence then looked like that we had a different RF shims, basically, or depending on where in the sequence we were. So we had like a global sort of shim for the inversion pulse, and then like a locally calculated RF shim for the, for the readout. Um, and again, I mean, it's just the same story in a way that there the, the, the was just a simple ex experiment with motor task um, that the you know, specificity of the phaser just turns out to be better than that of bold. I'm not saying bold is bad. I'm just saying it's more of a mess. I mean, if you sample that with a high enough resolution, you can clean it up. But getting to that resolution is just tricky. All right. Yeah, other things that we've been liking in Maastricht is going to ASL. So that is basically measuring blood flow. Um, so that's the way to really do that at high field because you can just about get away with it in terms of ZAR is using a you know, fair sequence with a you know, CRIPS2 preparation. And the tier foci inversion, you can also use worse pulses or something like that. But tier foci seems to have become the, 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 I mean, the thing that was developed in Nottingham a while ago. It's a pretty good and ZAR efficient pulse that gets you what you need. And then depending on if you want to measure, you can do like a multi-echo, multi di you read out to make it faster. We put multi-band in it and got it to reason reconstruct on the scanner using Boston's um, C2P stuff, which is really nice. You can really get the images four hours of the scanner immediately, which is worth a ton. Anyway, so those are these sort of maps. Oh, mine look much nicer than yours. The beamer isn't too great, but anyway, they're good. Um, yeah, but the multi-TI feature basically means that you can really follow the inflowing blood as it comes in from the arteries and sort of spreads across the brain into the cortex and back out. So that's actually pretty cool. Yeah, those things you can do, but you can only really do that because of the multiband acceleration. The readout itself must be kept at a certain reasonable duration, otherwise you're not going to get all the data and the time you have. So that was nice. It was never published, unfortunately. It's been lying around and gets shown in talks, but um, it's actually really nice. So this goes back to some work of mainly Kamil Uludak when he was still in Maastricht. He thought what, and he was always pushing limits much harder than we could bear, really. But he said, let's do ASL and let's do it at 0.7 millimeter resolution. And I go like, oh, that, that's going to be painful. And, and heck yes, it was. So the first thing was, okay, it has to be 3D readout. So we hacked the sequence to do ASL with a 3D readout. So we got that to work. And then the question, of course, that he asked, you know, let's do really good measurement, robust measurement of CBF of the cortex with 3D, but let's do whole brain, which basically meant we had to do multiple slabs, as you see here on the left. And what he wanted was to see if we can actually parcelate the cortex based on the blood flow profiles. Why even come up with that? I don't know, but he did. And some poor student was measuring and measuring and measuring and measuring, and it worked. So I'm not going to go into the further analysis of this. I mean, basically, UT1 gives you some, some indication of myelination and what's going on. And you see the sort of the, the, the motor cortex up here having a slightly different numbers than the rest of the brain. And you can't see that in the blood flow as well. well that's pretty sweet. 0.7 millimeter isotropic ASL. So with the right people and the right patient, you can actually do that stuff. OK, so this. Um, then goes a little, in a way, a step further almost. And the question was, can we do functional with it at laminar resolutions? 0.9 millimeter, but still pretty ambitious for ASL to start with. And those sessions were long, but it turned out that using single session fMRI, we could get that to work in the visual cortex fairly reasonably and fairly cleanly. Right here's a comparison between the CBF and the BOLD, and those are the activation profiles ex extracted from the blood flow versus the bold. I mean, with the bold, you see how it goes up, really literally shoots up towards the PL veins because it gets messed up, you know, by the large draining vein effects. 
Whereas if you do the CBF, which is completely insensitive to that, you will actually have a peak in the much lower layers here. Yeah? But it's not necessarily the same signal you're measuring um, because it also turns out that the activation maps of the CBF and the bold and all measure the same parameters. So the distortions are identical. So you can really compare things the way you should. And they have non-overlapping profiles. Sorry, uh, maps even. It's different voxels literally activated in the CBF versus the bold. But that, of course, also plays into this thing. So again, this is doable, but it's sort of pushing on the boundaries of what, what you know, I wouldn't call that a routine application, to put it that way. All right. Um, so having talked about EPI so much here, um, why do we do EPI? Why do we want to do EPI? Because we have it, and because we are used to it, and because it works. But in a way, it's kind of stupid. Because CBF and VASO, I mean, those are signals you don't want them to be acquired at the late echo time. You want them to be them as close to the excitation as possible. You want to have the maximum SNR, and you don't want them to get that messed up by the bold which inevitably creeps in if you measure any extended echo time. So, okay, off we go. Someone has to do the spirals. <laughs> Again, no rocket science, right? I mean, spirals have been around forever. But um, that's what we did. We took the sequence, ripped out the EPI, put in spirals, and for good measure, we said, okay, well, let's spiral out and let's spiral back in because then we can measure the ASL here. And if we land that at a reasonable echo time for the bull, like 25, we get both. So it seems like a good deal, right? And then you have somebody who knows about reconstruction, which was uh, Gilad Lieberman at the time, who was postdoc with me before he went over to, to, to Cowen. He deserted, unfortunately. You still miss him a bit, I have to say. But anyway, so we had the spiral sequence with the Cabrinha in between. Um, so we had these sort of two planes, and so there's this crazy wiggling of that little gradient going on. And you know, anyway, the point being that we had like a multiband spiral sequence, which we could reconstruct nicely. Um, in this case, actually using a minimal linear net, sort of a, sort of, sort of a very dumb um, um, yeah, I can't even, yeah, I can't, let's, just, let's just call it machine learning on simple network that reconstructed the images, which was nice and actually worked really well. Anyway, so we got something out of it. So images look like this. So you get a short echo time image, you get a late echo time image. The first one being, of course, interesting for the ASL, the second one being interesting for the bold. And that's the kind of stuff we get. If you look here on the left, um, which is a spiral, that's a perfusion activation. Here, that's the bold activation. So, I mean, you, you get something, as you would expect. And here, for comparison, an EPI, which is matched as much as possible, the lowest echo time you could reasonably get without being ridiculous with your partial Fourier factors and so on is 11. So you can see there's a lot of bold getting into the perfusion signal here. But overall, they're fairly comparison, comparable. And the bold signal, uh, of course, of this bar is a little bit better because of the later echo time, which is actually much more suitable for measuring bold than, right, than 11 milliseconds. But anyway, you get something in both. So OK, that worked. Um, so, yeah, then why get two spirals? You can just do one spiral, but let it go for a little longer. And then you can do something more high resolution, which is what we did here. You're not being overly pushy in terms of the resolutions, but something just above a millimeter. Okay, fine. Let's do this. Still use multiband, extend the coverage a little bit to 30 slices. Again, have a matched EPI for reference. And those are the um, ASL images in that case. I mean, they look pretty like they should, basically. Um, and those are the sort of CBF maps we get out of it. Um, and then comparing to what we would get with bold at that resolution, where the echo time really becomes problematically long. So 60 milliseconds gets a, bit un gets a bit long if you want to do ASL. So that becomes a bit of a problem here. You can really see that the... Um, so there's not fMRI, this. This is just the perfusion maps, right? They actually come out much nicer here in the spirals so they can come out with bold. And we haven't... Sorry, with the... The spiral ones are much nicer than the ones with EPI. And that's really not overly fancy reconstruction. This is really just doing something simple, and it's not as optimized as I'm sure we could have done. Um, fMRI, then. Yes, we can. So we take the spiral sequence for the short echo time here at the high resolution and do some fMRI, and we get some pretty decent maps coming out of it. Yeah, echo time is short, as you want it to be. Here's the EPI for comparison with that late echo time, because you can't do any better, you can't push any harder. You get something, but it's, it gets a bit bitty, and you know, this speckles, and it's not as clean, for sure. Yeah? All right. Okay. So the other application that benefits from short echo time, I said, was VASO. Um, we can use VASO. Um, Basal uh, fMRI here, so we use the same sequence, we use the same acquisition, same, same protocol, basically. In this case, we use the reconstruction that comes with scope, with whom we have a collaboration. So we actually do use the scope system to measure 
the trajectory, not in real time, but we measure it at the start just to validate basically the scanner's doing what it should. I have to say it pretty much does, right? I mean, there are little small deviations, but would they really matter on top of all the other mess you get with spirals? I'm not too sure, but it's good to be sure. Measure it, have it, use it in reconstruction. That's what we did. Um, right, so here we see the plain FMR comparison between a spiral and an EPI, and you obviously see the benefit of the short echo time right here, so I can basically sk uh, skip over that. Um, that's a bit of an odd line here, but never mind that. Um, so here, the activation maps we get with the VASO with the spiral, much better than what you can do with an EPI. You do want to measure a VASO at a short echo time. You really do. Okay. Well, we want to push the resolution further. So what did I say? We want to go from 2D to 3D. And we're getting, getting pretty sick and tired of all that coding and the Siemens sequences being stuck in an old software, which we know we would have to redo whenever we get the upgrade. It's been, um, watch my language here almost. It's been, <laughs> it, it has been annoying the heck out of me, I can tell you that. So with a new postdoc in my group, that's um, Emily Ma, who was at CMR beforehand, we said, you know what, let's use Pulsec. It's like this thing where you can code your sequence in MATLAB and then you put a file onto the scanner which has an interpreter on it and it runs. And it runs irrespective of your software, of your software version, but it also runs on different scanners. I mean, we don't care about that part. We just want something which is easily prototyped in MATLAB, which everybody can do at home, right? No license issues, everyone can do it. And then you can run it. So she did, like I said, we have all these benefits here. And she actually sat down and within a few days, she implemented the entire complicated Fair equips two sequence in MATLAB. It looks like this, you know, it's kind of pretty. And has the full field monitoring support as well in it with the reference and calibration scans and whatnot. Um, so that's beautiful. Gives you some images, just validated compared against the reconstruction that we had beforehand with the Siemens sequence. All comes out the same. So here's some um, perfusion maps basically at the bottom that we're getting for the low resolution sequence. I think it was 2.2 or something like that. And then when some, some guy in my group, Demo, came along and said, yeah, Actually, we can do like a different way of doing ASL. There's sort of this Torbofair method, which actually was published, I think, in some time ago. And it would allow, allow you to do ASL quite a bit faster. And then she said, sure, did it. And two days later, we had the sequence running on the system. Yeah, multiband spiral, doing a, doing a, a Torbofair readout here which is slightly different, I'm not going to go into the details here, but the point is really once we go away from the sort of vendor-specific environment of the nasty EPI code into which we had hacked the spirals, et cetera, et cetera, you can do things very fast. And this is something I hope we can bring up in the discussion after. I mean, to what extent do we want to be enslaved by what the vendors give us? I mean, I always wanted it because it runs in the system, people are used to it. There was always the sort of hope, oh, maybe Siemens goes, picks it up. We shared our staff with like 60 or 70 labs. People use it and that's great but it also hinders you so much in the development. It's, it's just so painful. And then all these software versions, and so we just can't sustain it. And it's boring engineering work that we shouldn't be doing. I'm sort of whining here, right? I think that's okay. Let's think about it. Can we get away from the sort of vendor-specific development into something like Pulsec? Could be something else. We could run BART reconstructions, for God's sake, in the background of, of the scanner, right? We hook it up. The guys in Bonn did that. I think they have a complete pipeline from Pulsec into the BART. So that's fine. Anyway. Yeah, so I alluded to it just a little bit. Um, we do field monitoring, so we do have a scope system. Uh, we haven't done much with it yet, other than just checking out the um, sequences. Um, yeah, well, that's what it is. What you get for a lot of money, you have such a system. You know, by field camera has 16 probes, and um, you can either sort of fiddle them around the Nova call, and actually scope, just to advertise it a little bit, they have a very neat solution for this now, where you can actually fit the probes into the Nova call in, in a sweet way. So certainly the Siemens version of the Nova call. Um, we have our own coil, um, which looks like this. We haven't used it really yet, but um, we have sort of these little tray things that Chris Wiggins and, and Maastricht just actually literally just printed yesterday, actually, to fit the probes around and for, for different positioning that you want. But it also has this large cutout here, so we can at the same time, if we want to do that, um, optically measure head motion, right? And the idea was uh, basically originally when we, when we got this coil, so already three or four years ago, um, but we never got to that actual project, is what they're now doing in, in, in Nottingham. And I think this is like super cool, actually, where you measure uh, the field changes induced by subtle head motion and you, you deduce the head motion from it without touching anything, without sticking anything stupid on the head, without relying on that camera, not losing sight of the marker and so on. Of course, you want to have the marker for 
reference because that has to be your gold standard or has to be the, you know, the, the, yeah, the reference basically, right? Again, to train your model for the motion. But this is actually some work here from, from Laura Bottolotti, who just graduated in, in Nottingham. And it's like super promising. You want to be able to measure head motion without sticking stuff to people. And you can reconstruct it in real time or feedback in real time, or you can feed it into the reconstruction afterwards or not more. But it's, it will be good to know that you can do it. All right, so I think I have some time left. I don't know how much, maybe five minutes. I want to talk about a PTX a little bit, um, which has been, uh, I guess, a bit like spectroscopy. <laughs> it's been this super promising technology for like two decades, but what have we really done with it in Euro, right? I mean, all these papers, if you look at PubMed, no one, no one really did, did, did PTX, right? Um, so we've done pretty perfectly without it, but, and our work around them, it was, was Andrew sitting there with his electric pads, sort of waving at me literally, but no, you can get a long way without PTX, but if you can get it to work, that's actually, it feels great, because the effort is so painful, <laughs> and then we see a nice image come out, go like, oh, isn't that great? Okay. But more seriously, I mean, the, the effort with using PTX and the instability of PTX systems that have been commercially available so far, it's a pain in the neck. It just doesn't work. It's not worth the effort for Neuro. So people have been getting up, Klaus shaking his head there, even in 9.4, same thing, right? It's just, language alert again, a pain. <laughs> so this is about to change. I'm just gonna say spoiler alert to universal pulses. So this is, I'm gonna, gonna show a little bit on it before I wrap up. Um, it's gonna take care of most of the problem. I'm just gonna show you some nice pictures here without going into the details of how we exactly did all the optimizations here. But this is at 9.4 Tesla, the distribution of the field that you get. And this is what you can easily get with the KD points pulse. So there's no magic there, you know, it's what Martin Close published a while ago. Um, you can make such a pulse, it's about two milliseconds long, you stick it into your sequence, do the excitation, non-selective, right, easy. Um, and you get something like this for the, for the homogeneity of the signal contrast. This is a 3D API, a bit ambitious resolution here, but you can do it. Um, and this is if you don't have that pulse. Yeah, this would be the, the best possible CP, well, CP-like shim, whole brain shim, you can get. So it, it does matter. If you get this to work, it's great. Then it feels like it's been worth the effort. You can also stick those things into an MP2-rich sequence. I don't have a comparison here without it. In this case, I'll show you one in a second, uh, which is actually quite nice. This is the 7 Tesla using our standard protocol here. Um, and if you mix in a bit of Kaiparinia too, which is actually nice. So this is our standard protocol here. Um, you can actually go double as fast if you just sample slightly differently. Effective resolution um, is the same. Acceleration is also effectively the same, but you go twice as fast, but just you know, making your readout a bit longer. Very nice. Um, other example here, pushing a little bit further here, it's a 9.4 Tesla. Again, MP2 rage, which by the way, according to Lausanne, I should say that, you know, he was my cast came up with this here, and it's, it's, it's basically the stock sequence that everybody uses now. So that's been a super important contribution. I should just mention that, I feel. Um, yeah, pushing a little bit harder here on the resolution, but you can still do it, you know, in a, with a proper excitation. You can get a very, very nice homogeneous um, image here all the way down into the cerebellum, which is pretty cool. I mean, this is what you lose first, usually, if you don't do it. You can do multiband with it as well, 2D excitations and multiband. Uh, this for an example here. Um, again, of the regular uh, CP mode, B1 profile, and what you can get out with the effort of a bit of B1 shimming there. It's, it's much nicer. And then you can you know, put that, and we mainly care about EPI, right? So put it into an EPI sequence and run something which gets fairly close to sort of human connectome type of uh, protocols here. So this is a regular Nova coil experiment where you have a lot of loss uh, in signal in the cerebellum here. But if you stick that in those sort of slice by slice designed, I should say, now it's not one pulse. You have for every slice basically design a pulse. It takes it forever, but you can do it, get a very nice coverage from top to bottom and bottom to top. You know, it's, it's all doable. And then you can start messing around. You go like, ah, oh, do a bit of spiral. Let's do a 2D selective excitation just because it's fun. And this was literally some project we did a few nights before an Eisen Rem deadline where we thought, okay, let's just excite two regions of the brain that can beam through motor cortex and a beam through uh, occipital. You now, what's the thing called? Cerebellum. And let's come up with an experiment that justifies us doing it. Yeah, it looks like this, works. And then Luckily, we have neuroscientists around where I'm from, and they said, ah, you can do finger tapping and we can resolve the digits. Now, that's pretty nice. So that's what they proceeded to do. Um, so you have the sort of the digit maps in the cortex, and you have the digit representations in the cerebellum. And this would really not have been possible if you'd done a whole brain acquisition of this. It would be super challenging, to say the least. Maybe if you do pedagogic pads there, I don't know. 
Okay, so PTX, uh, many practicalities are sort of solved with a lot and a lot and a lot of engineering effort, which in our case has been mostly wasted because nobody picks it up. The system itself is too unstable to make it worthwhile. Nobody uses it. We probably spend about 500 to 600 hours of scan time. What came out is three papers, and that's it. And now it's going to die because we get an upgrade, hopefully soon, and none of that stuff we did will be useful. I'm just saying that's how it is. <laughs> yeah? So we have all that stuff. Um, it's still slow. You still need to be zero maps. You need to be one maps. You spend 10 minutes of your scan session acquiring stuff that is useless, effectively, other than for making a pulse. And here the corresponding figure from the guys at Neurospin that I stole for this. Um, so ways forward. Um, well, <laughs> of course, everybody uses neural networks for stuff. Why not predict your B0 or B1 map if you want? Or why not? pick your pulses from a pre-calculated library, but why not just say, okay, well, there's so much similarity across subjects in your B0 and B1 distribution, let's just do that and make a pulse that one fits all and use it in a plug and play kind of manner. And that is the work that is Neurospin that we quite early on actually, so that was already four or five years ago. And the results are remarkable. Um, so space not being the easiest of sequences in terms of um, B1 distribution, um, you can really see how robust such a pulse works across a whole range of different anatomies. So it's actually quite nice. Um, they extended that to cover MP rage, space, flare, um, double, infu double, double uh, inversion recovery sequences, and it works pretty robust. And they, they actually, I think they give it out as a sort of a, um, what's it called, a, a C2P, sort of the, the deal that you do between sites um, and exchange it. So they've been doing that for the VB17, so the old software, I think they also have it for the Terra now, so it's just actually quite nice. And if you want to do PTX in a sort of more clinical or clinical research kind of setting, I think this is sort of the, what you want to do. Um, yeah, so just before really finishing here, um, so they came to Maastricht for a few days and we did some experiments where we used universal pulses which are slice by slice designed. And that's nice, right? So we can actually do 2D EPI with a human, human connectome type protocol here, really highly accelerated, like multiband 5 with slice specific shims mixed into each of those multiband pulses. Kind of complicated story again in terms of engineering. I'm not saying we did that in a few days and the work was done in Eurospin mostly. But anyway, so what that was comes out, you get very nice um, ethanol uh, using those universal pulses and it's much better than what you could get in record acquisition with the Nova coil. Yeah. yeah? Okay, so we're back to the slide here where we have listed all these things and only talked about a couple. But I think it's also clear that, you know, from the SNR limits and stuff I talked about, especially on the outset, there are a lot of ingredients that we need to work on. And whether we do that in baby steps or whether we do that in disruptive kind of ways, I think it doesn't matter. I think, indeed, in the sort of neuroscientific environment that I'm from, we don't like the big disruptive steps so much. Incremental is fine. Um, but we can address them and then we have to put them all together. Right? And the putting together, so of course, is hard if only different sites work on different projects. So there are certain projects going on, and I have a just a random pick of two that I'm going to mention. So one is the Aroma project, which is a FET H2020 project led by Neurospin. Nicola Boulon got that. We are involved in that. Zurich is, some call builders are, different people are. And we are aiming sort of to get sort of 0.5 millimeter resolution easily at 11.7. That's sort of what we're working towards. And those things in red is what we're working on. There is, of course, also, and I can't go without mentioning it, is the, the project of David Feinberg in Berkeley, which is a pretty insane technology push kind of project where he brings together all the expertise from different partners, including Siemens for insanely powerful gradient set, but then also the dynamic beyond one shaming stuff from, from MGH and, and whatnot, pulse sequence, image reconstruction, and so on. So there's a lot of stuff coming together in that one single project, which I hope will really let them do what they want, which is, I think, also 0.5 millimeter. So they're not pushing on the B0. They say, let's take what we have. Let's take the magnet, the commercial scanner we have, and just throw in all the cool bits we find in the different places. So I'm curious to what extent that'll work out. I mean, we will be watching that for sure. All right, so just to wrap up, I mean, EPI has been cool. It's very versatile. It's very mature. We've used it for many contrasts, it's great, but there's also time to move on to something slightly more ambitious, and I think you know, reconstruction and computa computational power allow for it these days. And there are a lot more fMRI contrasts we can still explore. It's not limited to CPF invasive that I mentioned. There are other ones on the horizon, <laughs> which will be nice. And just looking at the last part, th th I think we all agree there is a lot of potential in the PTX, if only we get it to work well on the systems we have, but also methodologically if we have things that are robust and really work. We aren't, we aren't there yet, but it's, it's coming. And finally, 
um, going back to, to me just doing little things and little hacks and little, putting little pieces together. Let's keep doing that, right? And it matters. If you just change a little thing or a big thing a little bit, you suddenly make it accessible to like a quite a large user base. And that really depends on who that user base is and what they want to do. And the neuroscience is often the small steps. Something really stupid, like changing a parameter and making a reconstruction factor two SNR better. You never know. Okay, so with this, I would like to thank you. Um, I'd also like to thank all these people um, in Maastricht and outside Maastricht. Um, you can read the names yourself. This honors the great universal pulse. I couldn't find a picture of him. He's a bit of an offline guy. Thanks to all these people. Thanks to you. Thanks again for inviting me and this opportunity here. I'm very happy to be here and I look forward to maybe one or two questions if you allow, probably not, um, or the discussion afterwards, which we'll definitely have. Yes. Yeah? Thanks a lot, uh, Ben, for sharing the excitement and also some of the frustrations. So we have time for questions. Maybe one or two. For one the sake of time, allowed. maybe one. Nicole. I'm faster. Use this. <laughs> um, so can you talk a little bit about your experiences with the spiral at high fields with off resonance? Or you know, I, I feel like your images looked pretty clean. Um, what did you have to do to, to make that happen? Well, actually, there's no much magic there, we, and we haven't actually explored that space a lot. I mean, it's a time, time, time segmented off resonance correction, basically, um, and the number of time segments varying depending on how long the spiral is. Um, I have to say our images don't look as good as the stuff that comes out of Zurich, and I really don't know why, <laughs> and it bugs me. <laughs> That's one of the reasons I actually started reconstruction with the scope stuff, which is basically the CG sense, you know, which also have to say, I mean, the expertise in Zurich for doing these non-Cartesian reconstructions is immense, right? They started this 20 years ago? Mm -hmm. 20 years ago, yeah. So they're pretty good at it. Um, yeah, no, nothing special. Short answer, we didn't do anything special, and we hope to do better. Okay, thank you. Vicky, I give this to you. Hi, um, maybe just for the neuroscientists, you said that it was difficult to use the, the PTX, but how much gain can they expect in terms of SNR? With, for example, let's say the simple version, universal pulses. Oh, that really depends on the brain region, right? And that is also why for many applications, I think PTX doesn't matter, because rarely, if you want to push for these really high resolutions, especially for functional acquisitions, you don't necessarily want to have whole brain. You can still get a long way with just doing a, sing, a simple B1 shim, RF shim, whatever, uh, on the brain region that you're mainly interested in, just move your sort of weak spots around. Um, so I'm not going to give you a number. Um, I'm only going to give you these images which sort of speak for themselves. But if you want to scan a brain region where there is a B1 void, you will have to fill it somehow. And you do either do that with this region-specific shim or echo. <laughs> or, or you really have to go for, for something like the universal pulses. I mean, if you really want a whole brain, there's no way around. You have to do something like universal pulses. Yes. Well, I can't give you a number. Sorry, Olivier. Yeah. Okay, so 